Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to extend my utmost gratitude again to Phil Export for having me in this very important uh, exercise and for us to be given the opportunity to share with you the benefits of uh, FPAs. Uh, for this particular session, I was tasked to talk about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement focusing on the framework of the agreement and also on the topic navigating rules of origin. But on the second topic, uh, my colleague later, uh, Ms. Cheska Enriquez, will be the one who will handle the same. So for this uh, talk, I will just uh, cover the policy framework of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, for purposes of this uh, presentation, I have divided the same into three parts. Bear with me because I have to give you a brief background of international trade and globalization. And then the second part will be the situationer of the country's trade and investment relations with RCEP participating countries. And the third part, which is a very important uh, question, what do we expect from this RCEP agreement? Now, let me begin with the statement that in the 21st century, the competition now is global. And basically, all aspects of business, all aspects of trade and investments are also global in terms of competition, from research and development, innovation, even funding for that matter. Of course, not to mention the market. That is why countries right now are, of course, uh, negotiating for free trade agreements because the end view is that we want to establish rules for purposes of doing business, for purposes of uh, making investments in other foreign markets. In terms of trend, right now what's happening is that there is an influx of regional economic integration. So many countries would uh, align, partner themselves with other strategic uh, economies and establish a free trade area, if not even a customs union for that matter. And offhand, uh, among the biggest, or I would say prominent, uh, regional uh, trade agreements right now would be the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, among United States, Canada, Mexico, the Pacific Alliance, consisting of Mexico, Chile, Peru, Colombia, uh, before, you've heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And now, uh, since uh, the United States opted out from this uh, free trade agreement, they call it now the CPTPP. And uh, recently, November 15, 2020, we just concluded and signed the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement. Of course, uh, in the screen, you still have India. But uh, India already opted out, so please ignore India in the slide. Uh, for purposes of highlighting the importance of this free trade agreement, you have to bear in mind that the ultimate objective is to open the economy, to broaden opportunities. And based on studies and also according to the submissions of uh, economists, there is a direct correlation between opening economy and economic growth. In fact, according to the World Bank, trade is central to ending global poverty. And it's submitted that countries that are open to international trade tend to grow faster, innovate, improve productivity, and provide higher income and more opportunities to their people. Open trade also benefits lower income households by offering consumers more affordable goods and services. So basically, the direction is that we cannot afford to be protectionists or close our markets. The fact that uh, there is already globalization, almost all facets of our activities are already integrated. And if I may be allowed, I can cite some recent economies or countries who have prospered because of opening their market. Recently, uh, we know Vietnam that uh, with respect to economic growth, the same is, of course, uh, towards, um, I would say, positive development. And one key element is that they have engaged and they have concluded and currently they are still negotiating a lot of free trade agreements. And uh, you know what happened to Vietnam. China 
is of course one of the recent economies. China basically joined the WTO only in 2001. So for all intents and purposes, they just embraced the multilateral trading system or the rules-based system in 2001. And henceforth, they have engaged in series of uh, free trade negotiations. And now there are several trade agreements that are being implemented. And still, they continue to forge and negotiate also with other trading partners. So that's for process of just establishing the correlation of opening your market for trade and investment vis-a-vis -vis, uh, economic growth. Now, since we're talking about RCEP, what is RCEP? Because uh, we heard in the news that this is a China-led FTA. But for clarity, it is important to emphasize that RCEP is a free trade agreement between the 10 ASEAN member states and five ASEAN external partners namely Australia, China, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. RCEP is an ASEAN-centric and ASEAN-led process that seeks to integrate and consolidate all existing free trade agreements into a mega-regional FTA arrangement. So the question is that, why is RCEP important, especially in this time of pandemic? One, it is important because as I mentioned earlier, it is an ASEAN-led FTA. So it being an ASEAN-led FTA, then the Philippines as a member of ASEAN has to support the same. But more than that, what is important is that we have to seize the opportunity right now. Almost all uh, aspects of economic activities have shifted from North America and Europe to Asia right now, particularly in Southeast Asia. And it is for this reason that we have to strengthen ASEAN centrality. Also, for purposes of regional balance of power, we need to consolidate and integrate our resources, <coughs> our markets, and also our uh, investment regime. Because uh, since the ship has already, uh, is already here in Asia, then we have to maintain the same. As I have mentioned earlier, the trend is that there's an ongoing uh, <coughs> regional economic integration in the process. And we cannot afford also not to follow the same trend. Now, just to illustrate also how the economy is performing right now in terms of the performance of the various regional blocks, I was able to get this slide from World Development Indicators. And from 2000 onwards, you will see the uptrend of the RCEP region. And basically, it has already overtaken NAPTA and also the European Union. So this brings to mind again the importance that indeed, we are now at the center of economic activities. More than that, the RCEP region consists of almost 30% of the world's GDP, also around 28% of the world's total trade. And in terms of inward investment, it covers around 24%. Now, when I say 24%, that means that this is inward. So the repercussion is that 65% investments are coming from outside. And again, it tells us that many countries, many economies are going in the RCEP region. And of course, in terms of market, it covers also one-third of the world's population. More than these very important parameters, going to the specifics, just for the information of the, the attendees in this uh, webinar, take note that when we talk about RCEP region, it represents 50% of global manufacturing output. 50% of global automotive output, 70% of electronic products, 26% of global value chain trade volume, and most importantly, the RCEP region is the main GBC hubs of Japan, China, and Korea, which are major economies right now. It represents also 60% of GBC for electrical, machinery, petroleum, chemicals, textile apparel, metal, and transport equipment and 35% contribution to global exports of electronics and machineries. Now, this agreement is important because unlike the existing ASEAN plus one FTAs or even our bilateral FTAs, RCEP agreement is considered as modern, comprehensive, high quality, and mutually beneficial. 
modern in the sense that uh, it covers uh, areas in trades which are emerging, such as uh, e-commerce, intellectual property, and also competition, among others. It is comprehensive because uh, it went beyond the usual cooperation uh, commitment that we have in our existing FTA. So the levels of commitment here are higher. That's why it is also considered as high quality FTA. And lastly, it is considered as mutually beneficial because uh, it takes into account the different levels of economic development and even social and legal development of the participating countries. So in other words, expect some flexibilities uh, under the agreement. Now, to give you context and configuration of the RCEP agreement, basically, you can classify this into four areas. One is on goods, wherein we talk about tariffs, reduction, elimination of tariff rates, customs procedure and trade facilitation for seamless trade, sanitary, phytosanitary measure, also standards and technical regulations and assessment procedures, and of course, trade remedies. It has also a services and investment, which covers, among others, financial services, telecommunications, professional investments, and movement of natural person. And also, area on sustainable growth. And we have here the small and medium enterprises chapter, which is, I would say, a milestone in the sense that if I'm not mistaken, this is the first FTA with an uh, exclusive chapter on SMEs. We have chapter on economic technical cooperation, and also we cover emerging issues. And the last area would be on business environment. That is how to improve business and investment environment. Thus, we talk about regimes on intellectual property, electronic commerce, my competition, at meron din government procurement. So, Question is that how do we fare now in, with respect to trade and investment with uh, RCEP participating countries? This is just a very brief uh, situation. It will cover goods, services, and investment. On goods, just take note that uh, we are all aware that we have been in deficit for several years. And in terms of our trade performance, Take note that more than 50% of our exports uh, are being covered by this RCEP participating country. With respect to imports, we source also around 68% of our uh, imports from these RCEP participating countries. So in other words, the RCEP participating countries are our major trading partners, both for export market and the source of imports. Now, as I mentioned, we have been in deficit. And uh, it is important to determine what's the cause of this deficit. Uh, as a, on a positive note, uh, it would be best to focus the, on the data that we have gathered. Because uh, based on this presentation, it tells us that even if we are in deficit, the fact remains that most of our importations are intermediate products or capital goods or those products that can either be used for consumption or also intermediate goods. So it tells us that many production and manufacturing activities are happening in this country. So at least, hindi natin ginagamit lang for final consumption. No? We are using the same for further economic activities. Now, if you will relate this to trade in services, we know that in the service sector, we have been faring well. In fact, we are surplus in this sector for so many years. The latest figure that we have gathered in 2019 is that we were able to generate $13 billion in surplus. And tapping on the list in the service sector would be business services, followed by travel. And of course, that includes tourism. And then telecommunications, computer, and information services because of our ITBPO sector. But again, relating this uh, performance of trading services with the goods se sector, take note that on manufacturing services, there is an upward trend starting 2015. And again, this is consistent with the increase in importation of intermediate goods. So talagang, you know, meron direct correlation. So since nag improve ang manufacturing services mo, so it follows that we have been importing a lot of intermediate goods being used 
in the manufacturing and further production. Now, uh, this slide basically uh, tells us no, the surplus that we have generated through the years. Now, on the third area, that is an investment, take note that in the last five years, the investments that we have received from the RCEP participating countries ranges only from around 10% to 12%. So it tells us that there are still a lot of opportunities that we can promote to these RCEP participating countries and invite them to invest more here in the Philippines. Because if you will analyze the current configuration of our investments, the bulk of our FDIs would come from the United States and European countries. And since these countries are not FTA partners, it would be best that these RCEP participating countries maximize their investment here in the country. So with this uh, brief situation of our trade and investment, then we cannot really afford not to be part of this large free trade agreement. Now, the most important question is that what do we expect, expect from the RCEP agreement? First, I will walk you through to some studies conducted on RCEP. One, we have the study conducted by the Philippine Institute on Development Studies. And the second is the recent study made by the UNTAD last year. Uh, in the study of PIDs, the improvements expected would be in the sectors of manufacturing, construction, transportation, machinery, and agriculture and that there will be trade creation effects. And in the process, expect around 10% increase in exports within the RCEP region. Of course, the PH exports will improve. And in terms of GDP growth, expect at least 3% increase. And this is not to mention the increase in household income and decline in poverty incidence. Of course, this study was made in 2016 and the assumptions are far different from the outcome of the RCEP agreement. But just the same, this is worthy of reference, considering that it gives us an idea on what will be the effect of this RCEP agreement once implemented. On the study conducted by UNGTAG, uh, according to them, expect also an increase in exports in the region by 10%. This is almost similar to the findings of PIDs in 2016. But most importantly, there will be an increase in intra-regional investment financial integration. So in other words, expect more mergers and acquisitions from financial institutions. And in fact, this is already happening even during the negotiation of RCEP. Also, another important development is the intra-regional industrial connection will support efficiency-seeking FDIs and help post-pandemic recovery and JBC. This means that many uh, investments in infrastructures will be made because countries would like to optimize the implementation of the RCEP agreement. Uh, you expect also investment policy priorities to support post-pandemic acceleration, GBC investment for development, and of course, sustainable recovery. And uh, according to one economist, uh, in terms of uh, GDP growth, by 2030, the expected increase is only very minimal, that is 0.2%. But of course, uh, this is a calculation based on certain assumptions. But for the Philippines, what is important is that we can say that through the RCEP agreement, this will offer cheaper costs to our stakeholders, particularly our micro and small and medium enterprises. It will offer convenience. It will also offer competitiveness and complementation. So basically, these are the four uh, big advantages that we can expect from the RCEP agreement. And I will explain this uh, one by one. First, on cheaper costs. Why do I say that it will offer cheaper costs to our stakeholders? Some of the critics of the agreement would say that RCEP is of no value because we have already existing ASEAN plus one FTAs. But take note, when you talk about FTAs, we are not just talking about goods. We talk also about other areas, such as services, investment, also rules, among others, and also degree of tariff liberalization. Now, this slide would tell us the levels of tariff liberalization of RCEP vis-a-vis -vis other ASEAN plus one FTAs. And you will note that under RCEP, we have the highest tariff liberalization. When I say tariff liberalization, this means that either tariff rates have been eliminated, so zero na, 
or we have substantially reduced the same. So with this 98.1% tariff liberalization, so basically 1.9% lang of the tariff lines ang na-exclude natin. So in-offer natin dito sa RCEP. So what does it tell us if you have 98.1% tariff liberalization? So this means cheaper raw materials and intermediate goods, cheaper capital goods, cheaper goods for consumers. Primarily because wala nang tariffs o kung may tariffs man, substantially reduced. And take note that tariff elimination in RCEP is around 92%. So yung tariff reduction lang natin dito is maliit lang, around 6%. In addition to that, since we have simplified rules, meaning uh, in terms of conducting trade within the RCEP region, we have customs procedures that are in a way uniform. So therefore, this will facilitate trade in the process. Since we have unified rules, then it will also offer less barriers to our exporters and importers. And the end result to that is that it will result to uh, less administrative costs and, of course, trade facilitative. That's why we claim that this offers cheaper costs to our stakeholders. The second benefit is that the agreement will offer convenience. Why convenience? Number one is that the agreement provides enhanced rules on non-tariff measures. So we know that this is one of the big challenges of our stakeholders. The compliance with certain non-tariff measures being implemented by our trading partners. But under the agreement, we have now detailed provisions, for example, on import licensing procedures. We have rules on NPMs that are very transparent. We have notification and also consultations provisions. So in other words, if you have an issue on the implementation of non-tariff measures, then easily the same can be addressed because there is a mechanism wherein the same will be resolved. On customs cooperations, then again, that's another advantage because our Bureau of Customs will now have to really proceed with the modernizations of their system. It will also provide cooperation activities for them. And most importantly, it will be trade facilitative. And one concrete agreement here is that in terms of procedure, there is an undertaking to release goods within 48 hours for ordinary goods and for perishable goods, six hours. So you could just imagine if this will be in place, then in the RCEP region, it will be easier now to conduct trade. Uh, we have elaborate, clearer, and predictable rules on sanitary and phytosanitary measure, as well as on technical barriers to trade. So again, in terms of standards, technical regulations, if you have difficulty complying with the same, then you can resort to consultations. And if you have some issues, then you can also make use of the mechanism to resolve the same. And in terms of trade facilitation for purposes of uh, exporting uh, products in the RCEP region, there is a flexible certification procedure. So you can opt for certificate of origin or declaration of origin by approved exporter or declaration of origin by exporter or the producer. And therefore, this will be easier now for businesses to use the FDA. And this is not to mention that the parties or the participating countries have undertaken to uh, establish an electronic system for trade transaction. And again, this is timely because uh, under this pandemic, we rely heavily on online transaction. Again, uh, I mentioned that we have already existing ASEAN plus one FTAs. More than the higher tariff liberalization, the agreement offers one set of rules. So for purposes of conducting trade, you don't have to go individually to these various ASEAN plus one FTAs isang agreement na lang ang reference mo. Also, for purposes of um, uh, using certification procedures and rules, then again, one set of books, you have only the RCEF agreement. So, in terms of accumulation also, you can uh, make use no, of the 14 countries for purposes of sourcing also your raw materials. So, that's a big advantage also because the materials coming from the RCEF region would be conferred originating status. So that's why uh, we claim that uh, it offers also convenience. The third benefit is that uh, RCEP also offers competitiveness to our stakeholders. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, one is that RCEP presents a more stable and predictable business environment 
which is expected to attract more investments in the country. This is manifested through the comprehensive chapters on investment, trade and services, including financial and telecommunication services, intellectual property, e-commerce, and competition. So in other words, in these areas, we have, we have agreed on minimum standards of rules and disciplines that will be adapted and implemented within the RCEP region. So in other words, if you want to do business in the region, in a way you would expect that the rules are similar no? or there are certain standards. So it will not be difficult for you that when you go to another market, there's another set of rules. So basically, the rules of the game have been uh, laid down properly. Also, it will offer you competitiveness because in the sense, you have good market access or rather enhanced uh, market access on certain products. So for example, I'll just focus on uh, the five ASEAN external partners. Uh, I would like to call your attention to the green column. So take note that in Australia, uh, under RCEP, it has liberalized 99.3% of its tariff lines. And almost all our exports to Australia are covered. So ibig sabihin, halos zero na siya. Or kung hindi man, na-reduce. Sa China, ganun din, 95.1%. And yet, we have covered almost all our exports to China. In Japan, it has a higher tariff liberalization, 92.1%. But in RCEP, we have only covered 83%. But this is okay because we still have the Philippine-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. So for those goods that are not covered, we can resort to the PJEPA or maybe the ASEAN-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. For Korea, uh, same thing. It has a high tariff liberalization rate, but the trade value that we have captured is only 91.5%. Uh, we do not have a bilateral FTA yet with South Korea. We have a regional FTA that is the ASEAN-Korea. And we have yet to cover some of our major exports to Korea. And this 8.5% that we were not able to cover, ito yung mga bananas and tropical fruits, no? such as pineapples and mangoes. And for New Zealand, same as Australia, we have covered also almost all our exports in this country. And of course, as I mentioned, since we were able to secure enhanced market access, uh, these are some of the key products of interest to uh, the Philippines no, that we were able to uh, secure in the agreement. Okay. Uh, another uh, advantage for competitiveness is the one I mentioned earlier no, in terms of accumulation also of raw materials. So you could just imagine you can now source your raw materials from these 14 countries. No? Of course, 15 if you have to include the Philippines. And this will help a lot our micro and small and medium enterprises, especially those who are into manufacturing. So you can just imagine the garment sector can source materials from China and then produce it here in the Philippines and export to Japan and other countries. Okay. On certain products, we were able to secure liberal product-specific rules on key products. For example, canned tuna. So it allows global sourcing. We can source uh, tuna from Norway, Papua New Guinea, canned it here in the Philippines and export in the RCEP region. So that's for goods. On services, we have in a way guaranteed market access for services. And when I say guaranteed market access, in other words, in the current regime of these uh, participating countries, they cannot afford to change or in a way overhaul their uh, laws, rules and regulations for purposes of providing certain services. So for example, in Australia, they have opened up business services, professional and management consulting services, telecommunication services, audiovisual services. So Australia, in the future, cannot just pass laws, rules, and regulations that will restrict the entry of Filipinos doing business in the sector of telecommunication or audiovisual services or maybe consulting services. Ganon din sa China, sa legal services, taxation, etc. So that's why we claim that, in a way, we have guaranteed. You want to do some uh, architectural services or you want to establish an office that provides architectural services in China, you can do so because they have um, committed that under our set. So same thing in transport services in Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, among others. So these are just examples. 
Also, it ensures preferential treatment for Filipino professionals and business persons. Because if our uh, kababayans, no, who are professionals, engineers, architects, for example, who would like to, let's say, provide services in these countries for purposes of entry, then visa facilitation will be provided by the RCEP participating countries. Another important element in competitiveness is a strong IP regime. We know that in every country, there is a different laws, rules, and regulations for purposes of protecting and enforcing IP. But through RCEP, uh, basically, uh, the parties have now committed to implement certain laws, rules, and regulations consistent with the interest of the Filipinos. So in a way, uh, we expect that the levels of protection that will be afforded in other countries will be the same level of protection that we afford to our inventors, authors, performers. So that's very important. And also for purposes of protecting the genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions, of, uh, particularly of indigenous peoples, we have also uh, agreed in RCEP to in a way promote, uh, uh, provide an adequate protection. No? And that also covers promotion of culture and arts in the process. Now, the last important benefit is that complementation. Because uh, in RCEP, as I mentioned, it's a huge uh, free trade area. The competition is global. So the important question to our local industries is that, are we ready? to compete with other uh, investors or uh, businesses for that matter. Now, we submit that, yes, we are ready because uh, we have a lot of uh, programs and initiatives that we can take advantage of, uh, not only under international cooperations, but even internally. For our micro, small, and medium enterprises, the fact that we have a dedicated chapter on SME, that's a big accomplishment. Because uh, at the very least, uh, cooperation efforts in the agreement will be focused on SME's uh, welfare. Uh, we have provisions on e-commerce, financial services, digitalization. And again, these are very important in empowering the competitiveness of our micro, small, and medium enterprises. Take note that one of the offensive interests of the Philippines, not only in FTAs, but even in other fora like APEC, or even the WTO for that matter, we have been advocating to integrate MSME into the global value chain or to internationalize the participation of SME in the GBC. Expect improvement also in financial services because uh, player, new players in the financial sector will pave the way for the development of new financial products. Again, uh, this will uh, generate more digital banking and our MSMEs will benefit from the same. Digital banking, an example of which will be Jika, Smart Padala, and other uh, evolving products right now. Same thing with the telecommunication sector. Expect more players and value-added services. So mga applications, software program like Barbe, Viber, WhatsApp, etc. that lessens the cost of communications will also increase. We also want to promote the country as the investment hub in the region. And uh, we tell our trading partners, even if they are not parties to the RSF agreement, they can take advantage of the same and make the country as the manufacturing and research and development hub here in the region. So for example, if you have partners in the European countries, let's say Italy, producing leather products, leather bags, since we have a very good leather industry here in the Philippines, they can locate here in the Philippines, manufacture leather bags, and we can export that to the RSF region. Because if these bags or leather products will be coming from the European countries, then it will be imposed 10 to 20% tariff rate in China. Same thing with uh, partners from the United States, uh, manufacturing freezers or refrigerators. They can manufacture it here in the Philippines and export to the RSF region. Same thing with uh, vaccines, also auto parts, and also R&D, among others. So here in these slides, you will see the illustration on how other trading partners can take advantage of our set. Of course, economic technical cooperation is uh, present in the agreement, and I don't want to highlight, it, highlight this anymore. 
it being uh, self-explanatory. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is aligned also with the current and um, current government initiatives and programs of the government, particularly our industry development program and inclusive innovation strategy. So we have many programs and projects no, from capacity building, industry promotion, repurposing manufacturing, regional inclusive innovation centers, and startup development program. And just for your information, uh, some of the top priority subsectors for industry development would cover auto, auto parts, electronic, aerospace, chemicals, furniture, garments, creative industries, shipbuilding, iron and steel, agribusiness construction, ITBPM, transport, logistics, and tourism. So if you are a businessman and you want to venture into some uh, businesses, uh, it would be best for you to consider also or align your business with this top priority subsector so that it would be easier for you to be part of the GBC. Uh, I have mentioned the inclusive innovation industrial strategy, and I have always said that we have a comparative advantage in this area not only because we have uh, very innovative and dynamic professionals, but our legal and institutional uh, infrastructures are ready to address uh, the evolving needs in the innovation arena. We have many uh, innovation technology support offices and innovation centers in the country. One town, one product, this is very important, especially if we want to tap foreign markets. So it's time for us to realize that the market is not just local. No, you can expand your market abroad. And some of the auto products that may be of interest to our MSMEs would be, for example, in China, rubber and bamboo products. Uh, Japan, the milk piece, citrus, coffee, and banana chips and wine. Korea, milk piece, cassava, kasoy, among others. So these are some of the goods that we were able to secure uh, enhanced market access in our set. And of course, recently, the Board of Investment uh, under DTI just launched this Make It Happen in the Philippines. And the intent is to generate investments, leads from 18 countries in Asia Pacific, Europe, and America. This campaign will focus on key industries such as automotive, aerospace, electronics, ITBPM, copper, and nickel. Now, on the aspect of protecting our local industries, Yung isang concern is that papano yung mga farmers, papano yung mga local producers natin. Now, in the negotiation, we made sure that some of these uh, sensitive products or highly sensitive products are excluded. So in other words, they are still protected by tariffs. So for example, sa agri-products, swine, meat, potato, onions, vegetables, coffee, maize, rice, sugar, they have been excluded. For industrial goods, cement, chemicals, lead acid, auto parts, they have been excluded because we know that we have local companies, local industries that are also producing and competing with some uh, foreign competitors in this area. So we made sure that they are protected still with that. So in sum, RCEP can help businesses access to cheaper inputs, lower administrative costs in conducting trade, for farmers, key agricultural, agricultural products are still under tariff protection while enjoying access to cheaper farm inputs and implements, access to bigger market, stronger and balanced IPR protection and enforcement. It will encourage exports because of the simplified rules and that the agreement is trade facilitative. It's a good platform for cooperation and most importantly, network with other businesses. It will uh, ensure a uh, level playing field in business and investment while maintaining flexibilities to address national interests. And of course, stability and predictability on core trade and investment rules and disciplines. So this agreement will definitely be very useful and we hope that our stakeholders would uh, avail of the same or utilize the agreement so that we can ensure their competitiveness. Lastly, I would like to end this uh, study conducted by Oxford Economics in 2019. This was prior to the pandemic. But what is uh, interesting and also promising in this study is that Philippines has been identified as the, one of the top 10 leading emerging markets that will dominate the global economy in the next decade. 
And one of the big considerations here is the comparative advantage of the Philippines in services. So I hope with your cooperation, with the availment of FTAs, we can make this uh, projection a reality. So maraming salamat. Again, uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we'd like to thank Phil Export for inviting us to today's session and giving us the opportunity to talk about how FTAs can really assist our exporters uh, in accessing markets abroad. I think ASEC Allen has given us a very good overview of why RCEP is an agreement that exporters should look into. Uh, while it is not yet in place, we have the time to really prepare for its implementation. Rules of origin is one of the topics uh, that many companies approach the DTI requesting for more uh, explanation you know, on really how to implement this, on how to meet the requirements. And hopefully uh, my presentation this afternoon uh, can shed some light on the basic ROO principles and what we should prepare for for the RCEP. So just to start, um, I understand most of you would already be familiar with the concept of rules of origin, but just to give us a very quick background, uh, ROO is essentially the list of rules uh, and list of procedures that a company must meet in order to benefit uh, the lower preferential tariff provided uh, in an FTA or any other type of trade agreement. Uh, this includes the GSP and the like. Uh, so for this afternoon, I will be focusing on ROO as it is applied in FTAs. So generally, if uh, one looks at the FTAs that the Philippines has entered into, for any product, uh, to avail of the preferential tariffs provided, uh, you must meet um, one of these three uh, basic rules. Um, first, whether the good is wholly obtained or produced uh, in a party. Second, if it is produced in a party exclusively from originating materials from one or more of the parties. Or three, it must have undergone a substantial transformation, which is usually uh, defined by meeting a value addition requirement or for your inputs to have met a change in tariff, tariff classification or for the product to have been manufactured through a very specific process rule. So WO or wholly obtained or produced in a party are essentially goods that are naturally occurring. These are planted, these are harvested, these are mined. So some examples as seen on screen are the usual fruits and vegetables, um, ores that are mined, um, fishes, and the like. Produced entirely in a party or the PE rule, um, these pertain to products uh, that are manufactured using inputs that all come from uh, an FTA party. So in this example, uh, in producing pineapple tidbits, uh, you use uh, pineapples that are originating from the Philippines, you use sugar originating from Thailand, and pineapple concentrate originating from Indonesia. Now, this does not reflect the actual production process of Del Monte, but this is just an example to highlight how this rule is applied. So you can see that all of the materials used come from parties to the RCEP. So last but not the least, uh, substantial transformation in a party, as I mentioned, is meeting either one of the three rules flashed on screen. So regional value content, or RVC, means that in the manufacture of a good, you meet a specific value threshold as identified in the agreement. So in most of the Philippines FTAs, this is uh, an RVC threshold of 40%. So it means that 40% of the content of a product or the inputs into a product come from one of the parties of the FTA. So it can be, the, for our step, that can be the Philippines, it can be an, another ASEAN member state, it can be China, Japan, Korea, Australia, or New Zealand. And when we say inputs, this is not limited to actual physical inputs like materials, but this can also include labor costs, electricity, and the like. Change in tariff classification means that the 
non-originating or inputs that you have used coming from outside the region uh, meet a change in tariff classification. So uh, one good example would be, let's say, importing leather from the EU, let's say Italy, and transforming it into leather goods such as bags or shoes. So the tariff classification of leather is in a different chapter. So changing the leather to bags or shoes uh, causes a change in the chapter classification of the product. So it would meet a CTC rule. And last but not the least, there is what we call process rule, uh, where you meet a specific manufacturing process. So this is not actually uh, common in the Philippines FTAs, and it's very limited to a number of products. So usually this applies to chemical goods when they meet a specific chemical reaction. Um, this also applies to um, media products where there is a recording rule. So let's say you produce, uh, you, you record uh, music onto a CD or uh, a movie onto a DVD. So th that would be the type of example. Now also important, in ROO is the concept of accumulation of origin. And this is actually where RCEP shines. In the ASEAN Plus One or the ASEAN FTA that the Philippines has right now, uh, we are limited to sourcing materials from mostly ASEAN member states and the Plus One partner. So for ASEAN Japan, we can only source materials from ASEAN and Japan in order to meet uh, the origin criteria as I have earlier explained. So RCEP actually broadens the source of inputs by allowing us to also use inputs from all these other countries. So as you can see uh, in the example, this is what actually makes FTAs work, is being allowed uh, to use your participation in value chains. Uh, we understand that for many products, especially in the industrial goods sector, we use a lot of inputs from other countries. And in meeting the rules of the FTA, we are actually allowed to include these inputs into the computations that we do. So in this example, in the production of uh, a motorcycle, we source inputs from Taiwan and the EU, so them not being a party, if we are using RBC, uh, they will not be included. But since we are allowed to count as originating material the inputs from China and Thailand, then we end up with an RBC of 45%, which is above the usual 40% threshold. This means that the motorcycle can be exported uh, to our FTA partners and claim the preferential tariffs provided in the FTA. So how do you actually claim or how do you benefit from the lower tariffs provided in the FTA? Uh, simply meeting the rule is not uh, the end of it, uh, you must always have a proof of origin. So this is shown to the customs of the importing country, essentially to say that your product meets the ROO requirements of the agreement and is therefore qualified for the preferential tariff treatment. Now, most exporters will be familiar with the certificate of origin. Uh, since this is something applied across all FTAs. And I think in the earlier years when we were implementing GSP, uh, the certificate of origin form A was the required documentation. Now, as we move forward, uh, countries are looking at how to facilitate this certification process, make it easier for companies. So we've engaged in other proof of origin mechanisms, which includes um, allowing companies to issue their own declaration. Uh, we currently have this origin declaration mechanism under the ASEAN Trade and Goods Agreement, uh, the Philippines EFTA, and RCEP once it comes into play. So that is the basic gist of what ROO is. Now let's delve deeper into what uh, RCEP ROO looks like.
So as discussed, um, there are three basic criteria or three origin criteria that goods must meet to qualify for RCEP origin. Um, these are as listed on screen and are essentially the same as I explained earlier. So it's WOPE and substantial transformation. Now, usually the question exporters ask is which rule should I meet? And I would like to emphasize to everyone that the origin criteria is usually a choice, um, especially if you are able to hurdle all of the rules. So depending on your product, you actually have a choice on which rule to use. And in most cases, uh, for a specific product, there are at least two rules uh, that you can choose from. So the WO rule applies to all goods. So it's a misconception that it only applies to agricultural products. Now, of course, it is more difficult for industrial goods to meet a WO rule. So in my example, let's say uh, earlier for the leather bags, if you wanted to use a WO rule, it means that the cattle for which the leather came from was born and raised in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines was the one that uh, produced the leather and then made it into a uh, leather bag. So WO applies to all goods, although we understand that it, it may be difficult for some products to use this, code, this rule since you need uh, imported inputs uh, for the production of your product. Next is the PE rule. Now, essentially, this means all of your uh, materials come from within RCEP. So in the example of the pineapple tidbits, uh, inputs come from Indonesia and Thailand. You can actually expand that maybe to even China and Korea if it is cheaper to source the inputs from there. Now, what we'd like uh, to remind everyone is when we say that a good is produced from originating materials, it means the inputs themselves meet the RCEP ROO rules. It doesn't mean that for as long as it was imported from an RCEP country, it already qualifies automatically. Uh, you as the manufacturer or exporter must prove that the inputs you used from these countries actually meet the RCEP ROO. And last but not the least, substantial transformation. So RCEP has uh, what we call Annex 3A or the product-specific rules. So all you need to do is check, uh, look for the HS code of your product just for the first six digits so that you can identify what uh, rule is applied to your product. It can be an RVC, a CTC, a process rule, or a choice between these three. Now, usually uh, in a Philippine FTA, that is where you stop. For as long as you meet the origin criteria under RCEP, you're already in the clear. Uh, however, under, so, sorry, for as long as you meet the ROO in the FTA, you're already in the clear. However, in RCEP, there is this extra step you must take as flashed, uh, I think, under PE. You must check if your product is listed as a product under tariff differential. In the course of the negotiations, it was very difficult for some countries to offer a single um, tariff commitment schedule to all parties. So it may be the case, let's say, for some products, uh, there is a lower tariff offer to ASEAN as compared to, let's say, China or Japan. So where there are specific sensitivities, some countries have listed a set of products under tariff differential. And all this means is outside of meeting any of these three rules, uh, you must make sure that your manufacturing process goes beyond minimal operations and you have a domestic value addition of 20%. So regardless if your rule is PE, or let's say you use the CTC rule, you must make sure that you have a domestic value addition of 20%. So for a Philippine manufacturer, it means 20% of the value of the product uh, must have um, Philippine inputs. 
Now, going into the three types of substantial transformation, and just as a quick explanation, uh, when you compute uh, RVC, there are two formulas uh, you can use. First is the indirect, and second is the direct. So at the end of the day, you will still just need to meet 40% value addition. There is a difference on how you compute it depending on what supporting documents you, you provide or what is easier for a company. So under an indirect computation, you take the FOV value of your product and you just subtract the value of all non-originating materials. You get the percentage of that and it should be 40%. Uh, for the direct means you want to build up to 40%, then you add the value of your originating materials, your labor labor cost, overhead cost, your profit, and maybe any other costs associated with manufacturing. Again, you get the percentage and it must uh, meet at least 40%. So unlike some of the FTAs under RCEP, exporters have the option to choose what method to use. Now, as I said, um, there is an Annex 3A on product-specific rules, uh, which will list out um, the specific rule that applies to your good. So here, let's look at uh, Chapter 3 on fish fillet. So that's 0304. You will all see that the rule is CC or change in chapter. Now, you may be wondering, why is it CC if fish live fish is in the same chapter in 0301. So this just essentially means that for fish fillet, actually, you must have caught the fish and have been the one to fillet the fish as well. Now, some of the uh, rules that are reflected um, may not be technically feasible, and would, we would encourage... Um, Companies, if you have any questions on how these rules are applied, to approach us or the EMB so that we can assist you in better understanding the rules. Now, what makes the PSR uh, very important and key in the RCEP negotiations is how the Philippines was able to secure improved rules for key export products. So we understand that some exporters are actually unable to use the ASEAN FTAs or maybe even our bilateral FTA with uh, Japan because uh, the rule, the ROO that is in place um, is quite difficult to hurdle. It requires significant value addition or it does not reflect the current manufacturing process in the country. So what is good under RCEP, we were able to improve some of these PSRs, uh, one example of which is canned tuna. So now, under RCEP, global sourcing of fish is allowed. So if you were to produce canned tuna, you can actually get your fish from outside of the region. It can come from Papua New Guinea, from Norway. At the same time, under Accumulation provisions, it can also come from within our sub-parties like Korea and Japan. Now, other uh, key export interests of the Philippines where we were able to secure improved PSRs are in garments, footwear, copper wire, and canned fruits. Now, under our SEP, and I understand uh, ASIC HEPI touched on this, there is a wider area for accumulation of raw materials. As I mentioned earlier, um, in the plus one FTAs, you are just limited to ASEAN and the partner. However, now under RCEP, you can source your inputs from the nine other ASEAN member states, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. So this is very important in accessing, let's say, the Japanese or the Korean market if your inputs mostly come from China. So now that they are a part of RCEP, using inputs from China will help you meet the ROO uh, in order to export your products under a preferential arrangement. Now, the rules are not just the only um, provisions we must look into. Uh, there are others 
specific provisions in the agreement that affect the determination of origin. So these are as listed on screen. So for example, minimal operations. If all you do is labeling, uh, let's say you import t-shirts and you attach labels, that is not allowed. Um, there is also a direct consignment provision, which means that your goods, when you export them, uh, they must go directly to the importer or the importing country in the event that you have to pass through other countries. And, and I understand that is a difficulty that uh, we face, uh, given that there are no direct routes to uh, a lot of our main uh, export markets. So in that case, there are certain rules that must be met so that uh, your goods will still enjoy preferential treatment when it finally reaches uh, its destination. So all these different rules explain um, how they can assist with computation of RVC or how do you determine whether you have been substantially transformed. And we won't go into detail today, but again, if there are any questions from exporters, uh, you may always approach the DTI for assistance uh, in understanding these rules. Now, just before we end, um, I'd like to touch on the issue of tariff differential, since this is something new in our FTAs. Uh, and, and really what it says is if your product is listed as one of those under uh, the tariff differential arrangement, uh, you must essentially have 20% domestic value addition. So even if you meet the PE rule, the CTC rule, the RVC rule, if you do not meet 20% domestic value addition, there is a chance that your exported product will not enjoy tariff preference. Now, one example that we have is for footwear. So, Let's say you wish to export footwear to Japan. So ASEAN actually has um, a benefit because in 10 years from the entry into force of RCEP, tariffs for footwear will be 0%, while for the non-ASEAN countries, it will be the MFN rate. There is no concession provided by Japan. Now, let's say a Chinese company really wants to sell shoes to Japan under the RSEP preferential tariff, what they could do is they could actually send the shoes to Singapore and maybe Singapore will attach a ribbon or add a design to the shoe and say that the shoe meets RVC40 in Singapore or the shoe meets the PE rule in Singapore and export it to Japan. Now, because of the TD rule, uh, Japan will ask Singapore whether they have contributed at least 20% into the production of the product. Now, we understand that simply adding this decoration will not get Singapore that 20%. So actually, Singapore will not get the duty-free tariff treatment, but will be applied the tariff accorded to China. Now, tariff differential does not apply to all goods, and I would suggest uh, companies and manufacturers to look at the list specifically uh, to make sure whether you must meet this requirement or not. Now, before we end, uh, I'd also like to touch on the proof of origin in the RCEP ROO chapter. And this is really just to explain that, you know, RCEP is one of the most progressive FTAs of the Philippines in that it has three certification procedures in this FTA. First and foremost, of course, is the CO mechanism where you apply for a certificate of origin for each and every shipment with the Philippine Issuing Authority, which is the Bureau of Customs. This is similar to what we have right now. And again, it's probably what everyone is familiar with. Second is an origin declaration by an approved exporter. And this is where a company uh, gets accredited as an approved exporter, again, by the BOC. Once you secure this um, accreditation, you can issue your own declaration for each and every product that you are accredited for. So you only have to go through a one-time application, and then you may issue your declarations on your own. Uh, last but not the least is uh, origin declaration by an exporter or producer. And this is actually one of the uh, emerging trends in recent FTAs. And this is simply allowing exporters 
to issue the declaration on their own. There is no application procedure um, implemented. Uh, and it's really just the responsibility of the exporter for every declaration that they make. Now, this last mechanism being relatively new to ASEAN member states and some of the other RCEP parties has a transition period in terms of implementation. So it is possible that when RCEP uh, is implemented, not all countries will be accepting this um, origin declaration um, by an exporter. And here in the Philippines, in preparation for RCEP implementation, we are still engaged in discussions on whether the Philippines will be ready to implement this uh, on day one. Um, if we are not ready, we have 10 years to prepare. If 10 years is not enough, we have an additional 10 years. It's quite long, 20 years. And we at the DTI hope that this can be implemented as soon as possible. So to summarize, um, if you will be using RCEP, if you want to qualify for preferential tariff treatment, um, you must first identify your HS code. Uh, you must check your product's tariff eligibility. Do you qualify for preferential tariff? Some products are excluded, so you really must check. You should also check whether your product falls under the tariff differential article. Then you must look at what ROO applies to your product. You must check whether the other ROO chapter rules apply to your product. And once you have determined you meet the rules, you apply for a certificate of origin or you issue an origin declaration. You send this to your buyer and then your product will be granted the preference. So thank you very much for giving me the time again to present today. Uh, flashed on screen is the website where you can have a read through of the agreement, uh, but understand it can be quite uh, legalistic. Uh, in the DTI, we do intend to engage on information sessions as we move closer uh, to the implementation of the RCEP to assist exporters and companies to better understand the agreement and how to meet the rules. So again, thank you very much. And we hope uh, this is piqued your interest to use RCEP once it is in force. Maraming salamat po.